say. All right. Um, Garen, you want to just flip ahead and we'll do a quick um, welcome back. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. And um, the next slide, just a reminder of who we all are. Um, we are once again super lucky um, that Josh Littenberg Tobias and Marvez are here um, from TSL. And so uh, they're going to share about the work that they've been doing uh, with Dynamic Supports. They have really great experience. And then um, we're going to get a chance to have uh, TSL personnel in the breakout rooms to work with you later today, like we did last week. So we are all super, super excited um, to get the chance to work with you all in small groups again. And as, of course, a big thanks to JT, um, who is hosting us from the Learning Analytics Learning Network. So, um, all right, here we are. Garen, you want to um, talk about today? Sure. So uh, our overall workshop theme was that first we worked on creating simulations with some form of an annotation question. Our intention in session two was to work on classifier training, um, but we had sort of a, a data depravity. We didn't have enough data to work on classifier training in session two. Um, session three, we kind of moved some of the classifier training, but we're still light on data. So I'm going to share what I can share today. Um, and the intention was to deploy classifiers and build dynamic supports. Uh, but as we have not reached a point of creating classifiers, uh, we'll just talk about ways and strategies in which you can create supports when they're not dynamic. Um, and there's one illustrative example that we'll do that's based off of Jessica Chen's uh, research that she's been doing with the, um, the Teacher Moments platform. Uh, so, but we will talk about what dynamic supports look like because uh, you will eventually get there. Um, and I will share like at least a preview of one of the classifier training scripts so that you can see uh, what is gonna be needed to get there uh, and how far we are. But also I wanna make sure that you have the resources that you need uh, to keep training your own classifiers. So we'll be sending out the text and the audio classifier after the workshop, um, but I'll just quickly demo the text uh, classifier today. And, uh, and I'm gonna encourage everyone to continue this conversation in the community of practice um, as we continue to roll out implementations and collect more data we can work toward building classifiers that can be deployed to the system. And you can continue to get support through the events that Sarah runs, um, any, any sort of supports that you need in terms of training classifiers or deploying, uh, Sarah can coordinate that through the community practice. But that does mean that today we might have a little bit more time uh, to work on the simulations themselves, which is gonna be great. Uh, so again, the more time and energy that we put into iterations on these simulations, uh, the better off they become. So uh, it's great that we'll have a little bit more time to work on that. And then, like I said, there's always ongoing support and connections that we can do through the community of practice. So today's goal, um, we wanna talk about how to dynamically support within simulations. Um, that does require having some form of a classifier to trigger a dynamic support. Um, and that is something that we're working toward. Uh, we have not yet reached that goal. Uh, so we'll just work with what we have. Uh, but we want to illustrate some examples that both use dynamic supports as well as there's ways to do static supports and then use those static supports to evaluate um, whether or not the support is effective. So again, we'll talk about both examples today. Uh, so today I'm going to quickly go over training classifiers. I'm going to show you how to do a text classifier in a really, really basic way. But the main point of the example is illustrating how to download the data and connect it into a script to train a classifier. And again, we'll send those scripts out or put them up on a link that you can uh, access after the workshop today, um, both for the text and the audio, uh, but I'll only demo the text today. Uh, the audio takes a little bit more work um, and I'm happy to sort of schedule, uh, you know, community of practice events that we could talk about. Maybe we'll do one of those that focuses on teaching how to train an audio classifier, uh, but then you'd have a script to work from you'd have a chance to play around with it. And if you get stuck, then you can maybe come to that future community of practice meeting and we can help you go through those steps. Oops, uh, after we talk about that, we'll talk about dynamic supports. Then we're gonna break back, um, have a, a short break, uh, go into the authoring uh, and sort of thinking about conditional content. Uh, we'll illustrate how to do that, but again, we'll show you strategies that can, uh, you can create supports without conditional content. Uh, then we'll go back into small groups uh, eventually hit another break. And then we're gonna really want some evaluation feedback. Uh, so one of the things that, one of the purposes as to why we've organized these three workshops is that they're really parallel to some bids that we have out for some additional funding. 
And uh, the surveys that we'll do at the end with the exit day tickets is information that just really helps us stay informed about making sure that as we move these efforts forward, that we get some um, end user experience perspectives on what the best things to focus on are. Uh, so that, that's what those exit tickets are really gonna focus on today. And again, that's really helpful for us to make sure that we're moving things in the right direction and supporting people that are using the product. Okay, so we're gonna talk about training classifiers. And again, I'm gonna illustrate that we're still sort of data starved, but um, a, just a quick reminder, uh, effectively you're trying to predict based on some set of features, uh, whether or not something fits into a binary value of yes or no, uh, the annotation component inside of Teacher Moments has been designed to capture that binary uh, label and associate that with either text or audio responses. Um, the reason that we wanna create this as a loop within the system as sort of a continuous improvement cycle in terms of classifier training is that once you train a classifier, the data that you've trained on can sometimes get out of sync with the space that you're predicting. And so as you like sort of do a simulation, maybe with your classroom, um, if it then gets used somewhere else, there just might be different data characteristics. And so continuing to collect label data to both check and see how accurate your classifier was, but then also fold that additional data collection in is a continuous improvement cycle that helps us consider the shifts of data and features. Uh, remember the cycle was that we'd collect label data, we do some feature engineering and pre-processing, class, classifier training, then check the accuracy and bias, and then operationalization. And again, we're not quite there yet, but uh, what we can do is at least demonstrate the steps of training a classifier. I'll do that with text and sort of let you know what the parallel to audio is. And again, we'll send scripts after the session. So the whole aim of building a classifier training through annotated self labeled data, where you as an author have created a simulation with an annotation question, is to sort of allow people that are creating these simulations to be also the authors of the AI. Uh, so we know that AI is uh, sort of ubiquitous, it's being used. Um, and one strategy uh, in terms of thinking about thoughtful applications of artificial intelligence is to incorporate teachers and educators as AI creators uh, and give them a chance to understand what the strengths, limitations, and, and benefits are uh, through the process of creation. So as you create your own AI, uh, you will not only uh, be able to create simulations that have fun and interesting dynamic supports that you can research their application inside of your classrooms, but you'll learn more about what AI is, how it works, and you'll have a sense of what other products that are using AI um, and what sort of strengths and limitations they may also have as you think about adopting more products that incorporate AI. So we went through the process of collecting label data and uh, I've shown you previously in the last session how to download that data. We've increased our numbers, but not by a lot uh, between the last session. Uh, so I'm just gonna step away from this for a second and talk a little bit about um, extractions of features for text and classifier training. So what I'd like to do quickly is just show you a, a pretty simple script. And again, this is not advanced, um, this is not advanced uh, work. The point of this script is a documented example that will allow you to pursue the creation of AI. And you can obviously overshoot the level of complexity that's here if you spend any time exploring different strategies for text classification. But it does teach you a little bit about the fundamentals. So the first thing I wanted to highlight is after you've downloaded your data, it ends up in some folder that has some particular name like this, peculiar name like this. So you put a path to that folder and then for the text classifier, all you need to do is connect to the annotations.csv. Those are your binary values. So if I download that data and connect to it, one of the first things that I wanna look at is you know that you can actually create more than one annotation question at the end. And so I wanna quickly check and see in that annotation file, how many questions of yes, no labels have been created for this data. So here's a list of all of the questions that have been created. And the next thing I'm gonna do is pick one that I'd like to train a classifier for. So effectively what I have already done is I'm gonna ask this question of, did you ask the students to provide Snapchat and WhatsApp video picture? So it's specifically asking if you've asked for um, a picture from Snapchat or, or, uh, or uh, WhatsApp. So when I pull that data down, you'll notice that only has uh, two values and seven records. So that's really not enough to train a text classifier, um, but, uh, what, I, what I'll do is I'll demonstrate the steps. Um, the first thing you're gonna need to do is remove potentially bad data. 
So anytime you train a classifier, one of the things you always wanna do is remove records that are not helpful. And in this case, it could be that someone went through the simulation and just clicked space and enter and didn't actually type a response. And also when you go to the annotation component, there's an option that you can click no data. Um, and that's when I'm asked to annotate something where there really isn't a response. And so either the text could be um, blank or the, the annotation could be indications of no data. And both of those are potentially problematic when training your classifier. So the next step of the script literally just removes the records that aren't clean. And you'll see even with this illustrative example of starting with only seven records, one of those records was removed. Um, that's because there's one record that sort of is a blank response. Um, after you've cleaned your data, always take a look at the distribution of your data. So we have six records to work with in text. This is actually helpful as a demonstrative example because it's so small, we can really look at everything. Um, however, what you'll see, what's great about it is it's balanced. There's three yeses and three noes. It's not common when you're building a classifier to have this kind of balance. It is ideal though. Um, and so there's lots of strategies that you do to deal with imbalanced data when you're training a classifier. But for this, um, for this toy example, we can sort of go through the steps of training a classifier and not have to worry about any of the imbalanced aspects of, of training a text classifier. So ultimately, when you train a classifier, if you remember the slide that we were looking at before, that uh, what, what you are effectively trying to do is predict y based on the feature space of x. So if you go back to this earlier chart, classifier training is all about predicting y based on the feature space of x. And this is just a two-dimensional diagram, but typically when you're doing classifiers, you have far more features than just two dimensions. And that's the case even with these six records that we're working on building a classifier for. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create the variable that has all of my um, features in it, my text data, and then the variable that has the binary label. So the features are coming from the text and the binary net label is a yes, no question. Um, once I have actually the raw text responses in my feature variable, the next thing I need to do is break that into like features. Uh, so right now, if you look at X, let me show that to you so that you can see what I'm about to do. And it's gonna be pretty clear below as well. But if you look at X, it's the text responses that people have provided. And those aren't particularly good features because it's not common for two people to say exactly the same thing. So what do you do? Um, one way to deal with this is what's referred to as sort of a bag of words approach. And what you do is you break these communications down into the words that are present, and then you turn each word into a feature. And I'm just gonna do a really, really simple example of what that looks like with the text classifier. So when I take my communication down and I break it into the words that are being used, the first thing that you do is you create a list of features. So out of, out of all of the six communications, here are all of the words that have been used inside of those communications. After I figured out what all the words are, I create some form of a vocabulary. And those vocabularies are basically assigning some numeric value or an index to all of the features that are within the feature space. Once I've got sort of an index or a vocabulary of the words that I'm using, what I effectively create is a matrix. So each communication can be expressed as a matrix of integers. And what this is showing is the number of times each word shows up in the communication. So effectively, you can see the first indexed word has shown up once here. The third indexed word has shown up three times in this communication. So this matrix is really a sentence broken down into the words that made up the sentence. And the number represents how many times that word has appeared within the communication. So it's kind of a weird way to look at text, um, but it's a way to take a sentence and turn it into a set of features that can be used for a classifier. Once you have the features created for a classifier, you can actually train a classifier. Now, again, we only have six records, so this is very much a toy example. Um, but one of the things that you do with a classifier is you break things into what data am I going to use to train my classifier and what data am I going to use to test my classifier. And so the train and test are the two ways of splitting it. And X represents the features, which again, are these matrices of integer counts of how many times the word has appeared. And the Y variables are again, the yes or no value uh, that we have from uh, the classifier question. 
So when I run this, it's actually going to train a predictor to make a determination of whether or not something uh, was a yes answer based on the mapping of the feature space. When I run that um, with this six record data set, it comes up with an accuracy of 50%, meaning that for the predictions that it made, half of its predictions were correct. Accuracy is the minimum way of looking at a classifier accuracy. There's all kinds of metrics that we can get into. It's actually just difficult to do that with such small data sets. But what I can do is show you what happened. So when we trained the classifier, here is the distribution of data that was used to train the classifier. It had two no's and two yeses to train the data. So it picked two of the records that were no, it picked two of the records that were yes, and then it used the feature space to figure out how to predict what other communications might be a no or might be a yes. Then what the classifier did is it made the prediction on the two records. And here we can illustrate a diagram that shows what was the annotation on the record that was predicted and what was the prediction. And what we're seeing in this diagram is referred to as a confusion matrix. And in this confusion matrix, we can see that there were uh, two predictions of zero, indicating two, uh, two predictions said, nope, this is not, they did not ask for a Snapchat picture or a WhatsApp picture. Um, and, and those two communications were in it annotated as a zero and a one. So one of them, uh, the person looked at their own communication and said, nope, I did not mention Snapchat or WhatsApp. And one person said, yep, I did mention Snapchat and WhatsApp or some form of that. And so part of the reason why this classifier has not done a great job at predicting these two records is because the data is so small. Uh, so we had six records to work with. This is effectively what we could do with this level of data collection. Um, so that's, that's just as far as we could get with this particular text classifier trainer. Um, I have additional steps and scripts that I'll be adding to this before I send it out that actually do a little bit more sophisticated evaluations of accuracy. But with the data capture this small, this is really as useful of an example as I could provide for the workshop today. And again, just because we didn't get there yet doesn't mean we're not going to get there. And I do think that effectively what we're going to be able to do is go through and spend more time today working on the classifier, uh, working on the simulations, uh, and preparing for another round of data collection. And like I said, we have community of practice events, so we can actually spend quite a bit of time uh, in the community of practice supporting future work and efforts as we collect more data. I will quickly show you that we also have a audio classifier um, file uh, and, and AC, there's actually a sufficient amount of data here to play with a little bit. Um, I would like to walk you through that sometime AC um, because I do feel like there's some uh, additional setup that's required to get this running. Um, but I wanna show you at least what the feature space looks like when you get into uh, working with an audio classifier. And when you get into an audio classifier, there's quite a few steps that you go through and there's quite a few features that you engineer, but effectively, just as we had a matrix of numbers for text, we end up with a matrix of numbers for audio. And what does this matrix actually represent? What we do when we classify audio is this script will walk you through the steps of processing from an MP3 file to features that have been extracted through the tool called Prot using parcel mouth as a bridge from Prot into Python. And what are those features? The features that we grab are this list of 61 features that we've um, using a script to extract using Prot. And let me give you some examples. One of the ones that I think is actually quite intuitive to understand is the, um, is uh, we could actually just talk about um, pitch. Pitch is like a pretty clear and simple, easy variable to think about in terms of vocal expression. But each of these features represent some additional capture of how you process and interpret audio signal. Uh, so again, pitch is easy, jitter, is sort of what you would expect it to be. It's, it's whether or not there's a shakiness in the communication. And effectively, each of these features are ones that will help you make some form of a determination, similar to how we're using words to make predictions. We're using prosodic features of vocal expression to make predictions when working with audio. So that's really what I felt like we could act, actively get into today in terms of the work, um, in part because the data capture was small. Uh, and it somewhat limited what we're able to do in terms of going over classifier training. Uh, but that just means that we'll have a little bit more time today 
to work on the simulations themselves. So I'm gonna go ahead and let's see, I'm a little bit early, which I'm not surprised by. So we'll probably just shift our schedule a little bit and, and spend a little bit more time in the authoring section. So I may have saved us about eight minutes in presentation time, um, but I did what I could do with the data that we have. Uh, and like I said, I'll send out some scripts for folks so that they can play with this data. Uh, and then uh, you'll have the chance to sort of continue this work and see if you can get some additional data collection to get to the point of training a classifier that we could consider deploying to the teach moment system. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Garen. Um, so we're going to talk about authoring um, and a couple of different sections today. So this part of um, authoring dynamic supports is more about the sort of what would you want your supports to say and do. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit and Garen's going to share um, about Jessica Chen's work um, that he mentioned before. And then Marvez is going to share about the work that they've been doing with Jeremy's journal, which you got to play um, through last week to see those dynamic supports in action. So Marvez is gonna talk a little bit about the work um, that they did to actually build those supports. And then um, after a little bit of a break, Marvez is gonna lead us through actually how to author the supports in the platform. Um, so that's just a little bit about what we're talking about when we're talking about authoring. So we've got kind of the, what would you wanna do and put in? And then we've got the, how would you actually do it coming later? Um, so, Garen, do you mind moving to the next? Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, dynamic supports, you want to think about, basically, this is a support that will pop up um, based on what your classifier um, has determined. And I'm probably going to, like, garble lots of the technical bits of this, so I will apologize in advance, um, and Garen can clean it up when he comes in to talk. Um, but basically, you want to start thinking about like, where do you imagine that your participants might struggle? And this is something that you'll probably refine as you get more data. Um, so, you know, Josh and Marvez have looked at thousands and thousands of pieces of data related to Jeremy's journal and have gotten to see a little bit about, okay, what are the people um, who are showing equity mindsets? What are the kinds of things that they say? What are the kinds of things that people are showing equality mindsets say? What is it that we could kind of um, offer to the people who are showing equality mindsets to help get them a little bit closer um, to what the folks with equity mindsets are thinking about. Um, so unfortunately, you don't have thousands of pieces of data right now, but that's okay um, because you designed your simulation with something in mind. You designed it around a problem of practice. So my guess is that you already have some ideas um, about what you're sort of hoping folks will say and what struggles they might have in getting there. So basically, you want to think Think about that. Um, so we can go to the next slide, Garen. Fine. So we're going to go through a little bit of an example. I always like to work through things um, with a specific example because I think it's a little bit easier to understand. So if you take your mind all the way back to the first workshop, um, Garen gave us a scenario that he had just created. He gave it as an example of sort of how easy it can be to create that four slide scenario um, that he had created in response to a workshop he was doing with Boston public school teachers. And it was about students um, planning a protest and a parent calling because they were concerned about the safety of their child during that protest. Okay, so um, I'm just calling our minds back to that. Here's a little bit on the slide just to remember uh, what it is that the parent says and then the kind of data that's being collected here. So you're supposed to talk as though you were talking to that parent. So we're gonna walk through kind of what sorts of supports might you want to give. So one option, and this is always a great option, and we saw this with the example that Josh and Marvez gave for Jeremy's journal last week, is just to ask some questions for prompting. So um, there's a couple of things that I could do if I designed this scenario. There might be a couple of things that I was working on. In this case, I imagined, um, let's say that I really wanna make sure that teachers are validating parents' concerns about safety. That's sort of the point of this exercise is that I wanna make sure um, that teachers are, are making sure that the parents um, feel that their voices are being heard to sort of build that home school uh, relationship. So that's what I really want um, my teachers who are taking, who are doing the scenario to think about. So in that case, if uh, my data shows that participants aren't validating those concerns, they aren't saying something about safety and the parental concerns, I might write in a support that asks them to think about that. 
Um, so this is sort of modeled off of what Josh and Marvez showed us last week. You may not have mentioned safety concerns in your response. How might you respond in a way that validates the parents' concerns? And then we give folks a chance to try again with this question in mind. Um, so I think that that is always a great, um, it, it's an option that I really like because it gives people a chance to reflect a little bit on what they said before and things that they might have missed in that response. I know that as a learner, it's something that I always really appreciate getting a question that I can think about and then having a chance to try again. So this is a great kind of dynamic support. Okay. Um, option two, more questions. <laughs> so um, this time I just showed how it could be sort of different. So um, again, it's really up to, I just wanted to show with how the same scenario there could be lots of different kinds of supports that you're building in. So the questions that I asked on the last slide are not the only kind of support that I might build in. It all depends on what is it that I'm hoping that teachers are really thinking about with this scenario. Um, so in the last one, I was imagining that my goal was to strengthen home school partnerships. And so I really wanted to make sure the parents felt that their voices were being heard. Um, in this case, I'm imagining that I student activism is really important to this school, and I really want the parents to understand that you know even with the safety concerns. Uh, there are great benefits that are going to come from their student taking part in this protest and so therefore my classifier is looking to see did people mention. Um, not the safety concerns, but did they mention the positives that the student is likely to experience in this protest and so now you can see i've changed my support. Uh, to think about that. You may not have mentioned the benefits of student activism in your response. How could you talk about the benefits of student activism to help assuage this parent's fears? Um, so this is just to show um, that it really all depends on what it is that you are trying to help people think about with your scenario. And that is really where the dynamic support comes from. What is it that you want people thinking about and practicing with your scenario? And then how is your classifier, how is the data showing you whether or not they are thinking about those things or doing those things that you want them to practice? And then how can you have a support that pops up to kind of prompt them to think about or to do those things? So I, this is uh, basically, it's the same option as the last time, but I just wanted to show you that the content of the support really changes on what it is that you want your participants to get out of the scenario. Okay. Um, another option is to offer some sentence starters. So a question is a really great um, open-ended. It gives people a lot of choice in what it is that they're going to say next. Um, however, some people might need a little bit more guidance. And again, this is where it can be really helpful um, to listen to your data, to get those annotations, especially if you've had people comment on what it is that they were struggling with. So if you weren't confident, what does that mean? What did that mean to you? If you if you were confused, right? If you have the annotation, but then also a chance for people to tell you, what did that mean when you were confused? Why were you confused? Um, so sometimes people just may not know how to sort of formulate their thoughts or get started, um, in which case we could offer some sentence starters. So here I've said something like, you may be having trouble finding the right words. Here's a sentence starter you could try. Um, again, this is a support. People don't have to take it, but it could be helpful for them. So I understand you worry about safety. Here's what we're doing to keep the students safe. And then they would put in X, Y, Z. These are the things that we're doing to keep the students safe. You can see that in this case, this is more of the first, um, the first thing that I was focusing on is really like improving those home school communications. So the parent is worried about safety. I'm going to tell you what we're doing to keep your child safe. Um, so this is one option to offer some sentence starters. I only have one here. You could have a couple of different ones. This is a very simple um, scenario, right? But if you had something more complex, maybe there's a couple of different things that you people could choose from. Um, but here I've offered just one. So that's another option. And then here you could offer a suggestion for something that people could do. Um, in this case, I've offered a behavior suggestion that really would work with any scenario. Um, I've written the language, so it's specific to this one, but with any scenario, and I think, Aaron, we've we've stolen this from Zubeda. I think we've stolen this from somebody, <laughs> um, but it's basically just telling people, you know, you may have had trouble finding the right words. Before you try again, write down some notes, write down three things, and then choose your favorite one, 
and start recording because people might just need that little extra suggestion, that little extra boost. So here it's been a behavioral thing. Um, I might write in a suggestion like um, many people who have a lot of experience uh, supporting student activists and talking to their parents, uh, make sure to validate the parents' concerns and then move into um, XYZ. They wanna build that partnership. So you might wanna try this. So this is a little bit more um, directive in terms of offering something that you could try to do or something that you could try to say. Um, but again, you just wanna think about how might people struggle here? And then what is it that I can offer to help them? What kind of prompt or support will help them think about the things or practice the skills that I want them to practice? Um, uh, can I just add two things about that, Sarah? Please, yes, um, please. In the scenario itself, you can have them write it down in the scenario. And that actually gives you some more interesting data capture where if you say, please write down three things that you could say here and then record a response, then not only are you getting the response that they've provided, but you're getting some ideas of what they were thinking about that they chose not to do. And that could actually be really fruitful information and in understanding the variation of how people might respond to your prompt. And I would say that one of the things that's uh, really nice about that is that uh, I've seen in other scenario reflections that some folks that say they had a hard time expressing what they wanted to do on an audio recorder just started doing this. So we've had end users that literally said, I just started writing down what I was gonna say before I recorded a response. So this is not only a support, but it's something that I feel like is already organic behavior by users that are using teacher moments. So I think it makes a lot of sense to suggest it because when you find that this is helpful for someone, um, not everyone's gonna think, oh, I should try to write this down before I record a response. But there are people out there that have actively already done that of their own volition. Um, and so that to me is a great indicator that this is likely going to be a productive support um, as some people just adopt this practice, whether or not you offer it as a support. Um, so I just thought that was worth mentioning. And if you build it in, you get a chance to look at all of that thinking that's going into, um, like I know, like as a, as a designer designing the scenario, like I would love to know what is it that people are thinking about that maybe doesn't get said um, or that they have thought through the process before they actually decided. So that would be some fantastic data for you as you continue to refine the scenario or to do research with it. Um, it would be amazing for that. All right, Garen's gonna talk to us a little bit. We're gonna do two Jeremy's Journal kind of supports and Garen is gonna talk us through the first one. So this is, thanks Sarah, that was excellent to like lead into what I'm about to say, which first off, I wanna say our intention was to build dynamic supports within the simulation based on the classifiers trained from your data collection. As we didn't get there, we decided to add this as an example. Um, and this is a great example of thinking about how to create a support as, and, and what we did with this one was something that was leading into evaluating when we might create or how we might create a dynamic support. So this was Jeremy's journal, which you've done before. Um, and just to recap quickly with Jeremy's journal, you go through the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Thursday, you make a decision as to whether or not you're going to give Jeremy a quiz. <clears throat> what Jessica was interested in authoring a support on for this was drawing attention to the fact that Jeremy had a stomach ache. Uh, and so what Jessica tried was go through the, the simulation, answer a few survey questions that give us a sense of what your experience was like within the simulation. And then Jessica added a second try. And with that second try came a support. So effectively on Thursday, you decide whether or not you're going to give Jeremy the quiz. And then you take some exit surveys that give us some instrumentation about your experience, but then you're given a second try. And so we show you, this is what you said when you were asked if you're gonna give Jeremy a quiz, yes or no. Um, would you like to change your response? Would you like to, what would you do if you had a second try at this? Um, and folks had a chance to, again, say yes or no with their second try. And then they also had a chance to explain their reasoning. And so what we were looking at was the support explicitly said or suggested that participants consider acknowledging Jeremy's statement that he has a stomach ache. Um, that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing that Jessica wanted people to consider was that when people have stomach aches, that sometimes that's coming from emotional distress. And when people are in emotional distress, they may not perform well on an assessment. So the assessment may not be getting at whether or not Jeremy understands the material. It may be explicitly influenced by uh, distress. And so that's something that is potentially of concern. 
And then finally, Jessica provided a sentence starter, just like Sarah was describing. And in the sentence starter, uh, what it was framed as is, Jeremy, I want to begin by saying blank. And therefore, I think the best thing in this situation would be blank. And so sometimes sentence starters are much more like a Mad Libs or something like fill in the blank, sort of complete the thought um, perspective. But what I want to point out about this particular sentence frame was that this was um, suggesting that you think about the stomach ache and indicating one way of interpreting how the stomach ache would influence the assessment. And then the sentence frame doesn't actually shape a response in one direction or the other. I could easily say, first, I want to begin by saying, I don't believe that your stomach ache is real. <laughs> Therefore, I think the best thing in this situation would be administering the quiz for you, right? So I can say either a, an affirmative or a, sort of a, a contrary statement about whether or not Jeremy's gonna take the quiz using the exact same sentence frame. So the frame's not actually constraining me, but what it is suggesting is that it breaks my thinking apart. And first by talking about some form of like reasoning or rationale or evidence that I'm using to make a decision about what I'm saying to Jeremy. So it's just really asking the participant to break those two things apart, which is what's the evidence or the idea or the perspective or opinion that I'm using that's informing what the best course of action with Jeremy is. And this is a way of encouraging people to be a little bit more transparent with their thinking. And, and again, what's cool about this is because there's a first try and a second try, um, you get a chance to see if this additional information and support has changed how people respond to administering the quiz for Jeremy. I'm not going to tell you about the results because this is actually, I just want to point out, Jessica is uh, working with us and is currently a high school student uh, and uh, has actually done a very small implementation and will be presenting results on this support at a conference in Qatar, I think in March this year. Um, so we're very excited and proud of what Jessica has been able to do. But I did want to point out to this group that the, the conference paper that Jessica is presenting on is using this kind of evaluation of a support in a simulation-based learning environment with an N equals 10, and it was, or 11 or something like that. Um, and so it was really a qualitative analysis of how people were changing their decisions and their behaviors and how the support was influencing that change. And I think that that's really illustrative. I've seen like now a journal publication with nine participants and now this conference paper with 11. This work is on the level of innovation that you do not need a large data collection to publish in a conference or in a journal. And so I just wanted to highlight that you can explore how you would support someone in a simulation because there's a lot of open exploration possibilities here and that what you would find even with a small sample is actually quite um, informative and can actually be something that other people at conferences and journals are interested in publishing. With that, I think we'll talk or sw switch over to Marvez talking about conditional supports. Uh, yeah, thanks, Garen. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the conditional supports that we saw um, in Jeremy's journal from last week's workshop. So like we said in previous versions of Jeremy's journal, participants completed a debrief at the end of the simulation. Um, if, if they were doing an in-person facilitation, someone would facilitate a discussion or if they were doing it like an online in a MOOC, there might be something to read or a video to watch about the scenario. Uh, and in the data from Jeremy's journal, we found common themes and responses that mentioned the equity related topics. If you remember last week, Josh showed us um, the topic modeling research that he did showing like the spread of equality and equity responses. And so we were really curious about um, how we can create conditional supports for people to notice moments of inequity in this scenario. So one of our variables is called learn challenge, which is in a response, does the response mention a specific academic challenge that Jeremy is facing? Such as, does the participant notice he doesn't understand part of the lesson? Um, is he doodling? Is he distracted? Something about specifically about his academic struggles uh, in the class. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, Sarah talked about this a little bit, but why do we want to use conditional supports in Jeremy's journal? Uh, you can give your participants personalized feedback instead of um, generalized um, sort of feedback about good job on getting through the scenario. Uh, in the moment feedback can help participants get back on track what uh, Jessica Chen is doing. By giving participants feedback and giving them that redo moment, they have to take a step back to reflect and reevaluate their responses and get them on track to continue to go forward. 
So in the version of Jeremy's journal that all of you played last week, we have um, two moments of personalized feedback. So on Monday, the participants are asked, describe what you noticed uh, and what you plan to do. And this is specifically about what did you notice about Jeremy's notebook? And what do you plan to do for the next class? Do you wanna continue with your lesson as planned? Do you wanna pull out students for small groups? Do you wanna work with Jeremy? And then on Wednesday, you're asked to explain your choice on what you wanna do for the next class again, checking in with students after seeing their Wednesday journals. Next slide, please. So on Monday and Wednesday, we're evaluating the responses across a bunch of different equity and equality variables. Learn challenge, do you notice his academic challenges? His social emotional challenges, do you think he's distracted? Do you think he's not feeling well? And these are some of the examples of uh, feedback that we wrote that you might've seen when you played it last week. So one of the things that we wrote is based on your response, you have mentioned concerns about Jeremy's behavior in class. Why do you think he might be acting this way? Is there anything about your teaching that might be challenging for him? So if you get this type of feedback, we're wanting you to really focus on what type of shift uh, in your teaching could you do to help Jeremy uh, do better? And based on your response, you may have not specifically mentioned Jeremy's academic needs and how you might support him. Did you notice anything in Jeremy's work and what kind of supports might he need? So Jeremy shows that he understands hyperbole really well, but not really the other part of the lesson. So we want people to notice that and give him good supports. Next slide, please. So some cool things we wanna do in the future is finish coding the data for the other uh, text responses in the scenario. Uh, one thing that we're really interested in is equity and a doctor's note. So in this scenario, the participant is told that to be excused, students need a doctor's note. So some responses, when you're talking directly to Jeremy about it, they demand a doctor's note from him and instruct him to take the quiz. And other responses focus on how he is feeling that day and make accommodations for him. Like you could take it later or you could take a shorter version. So that's one uh, point that we feel like we could give a lot of feedback and maybe a redo element as well. And we wanna continue to refine our models and feedback to give the best assistance to our participants. When I looked at uh, everyone's data from last week, um, most of the responses, you guys reported that you got good feedback, but about 10% of responses said that, oh, this feedback is completely wrong. So we wanna keep working on um, making those models better. Uh, yeah, next slide. I think we're getting ready for a break and we are uh, way ahead of time today. We are way ahead of time, but that is not a bad thing because we're going to um, come back and have a lot of time in our authoring groups, which is awesome. Um, so it's 1248 by my time here. So maybe we will come back at one o'clock our time. Um, so that's about a 12 minute break. And then we'll come back and hop into, I believe we're coming back to hop into our authoring groups. Um, so that is great. So we'll see you back here in about 12, minutes or so. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So what I'm gonna talk about real quick is how to connect the model that you put on a server somewhere to teacher moments, select which prompts are then sent to the server, design the feedback that participants see based on some like score or output and ask participants about the usefulness of that feedback. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, after you all have lots of data and you're able to make your text or audio classifiers, um, what we would do is on the homepage of Teacher Moments, there's a button called Admin. So we'd click that and next slide, please. And you get to a page about Access Control, Agent Manager, Activity View. Uh, in Agent Manager, you would click Create New Agent, but I'd also like to draw your attention. Oh, could you go back, please? Thank you. Um, on the left side, we have all of the different types of um, agents that are currently running. So if you look at the two on the bottom, um, there's two different versions of Jeremy's Journal uh, models running uh, for this, for Jeremy's Journal. Uh, next slide, please. So as an example, we're gonna look at how the Jeremy's Journal model works. Uh, so we click Jeremy's Journal, we give a name, um, a description, and then the two important things are the endpoints and the interaction type. So the endpoint is like where the model lives on a server. We've been using um, Heroku server. So this one lives over there. We have a, uh, a URL for it. And then in the next drop down menu, you have to pick a, a interaction. So you could have a text prompt, an audio prompt, a chat prompt, and a few other different types of interactions are allowed too. But we're just gonna talk about a text prompt right now. Next slide, please. So now we actually want to add that classifier into a prompt scenario. So this is a screenshot of a text input 
um, that you'd see on the editor side. So for this question, it's for Monday. Uh, describe what you noticed and what you plan to do. This is about the students' journals and what your classroom plan is for the next day. We're gonna, under optional AI agent to receive responses, we're gonna open that drop down menu and we're gonna pick which model we want to take in our text responses. So next slide, please. So on a new slide, we're gonna go and add our conditional feedback. <clears throat> so first we're gonna start with conditional content. Next slide, please. And then once you open a conditional content module, we're gonna select the active AI agent. This is really important or none of the rules and codes you write in will run at all. So we're gonna start with our Jeremy's journal model. And for this one, we can use um, X and Y a bool value such as like, if X is greater than five, if X is less than five, not equal to, equal to, et cetera. So in this case, if X is five and is also not zero, um, teacher moments like will do zero as a default. So sometimes it's important to include this, but we can ignore that for now. Um, so if X is five out of the, um, what we get off the server from Jeremy's journal for someone's response that they typed in. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have our rule set. If X is five, we're gonna select a new component to display. And in this instance, you can see that it is a new text um, response. So we've said, based on your response, you have mentioned concerns about Jeremy's behavior in class. Why do you think he might be acting this way? <clears throat> is there anything about your teaching that might be challenging for him? Sorry, I got cut off. But this is um, a piece of feedback. And since this is a text response, uh, participants can type in and reflect on what they just said. Uh, next slide, please. And then you might also be interested in evaluating how useful that feedback was for your participants. So in last week's scenario, we asked you, do you think your response was evaluated correctly? And we gave you three options. It was totally wrong. It got some things right, but missed some other things. It was totally correct. And a majority of you said one of the last two things, but some of you said the first thing. So we're gonna use that information to review your responses, see where the model maybe got it wrong. And this is something you can do in your work as well and see where you can adjust the model or your coding to get a better accuracy and precision. Next slide, please. Yeah, I talk really fast. We're gonna have lots of time for authoring groups. <laughs> I do wanna mention that the people that currently have access to the Teacher Moments platform are only administrators at the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT. So if you were to install Teacher Moments on your own server and host your own solution, you would obviously be an admin on that platform. If you do create a classifier that you would like to have deployed to Teacher Moments, that's gonna be a collaborative effort with staff at MIT, as we are the folks that have access to the administrative pages for Teacher Moments. Uh, so again, the community of practice is a great place to touch base with us and say, hey, I've been working on a text classifier and I'd like to add it to the platform so that I can uh, go through and, and do that. And again, we've illustrated the documentation earlier on how to fork an existing uh, teacher moments uh, compatible uh, classifier. And once you've deployed that anywhere, like on Heroku or any sort of hosting service, um, then you could sort of pro provide us with the endpoint information, which is just the URL that you go to to get to the classifier. And, and if you can provide that URL, then the admins at the Teaching Systems Lab can incorporate and include that into the platform. And maybe before we go into authoring groups, we'll just open it up for any questions. We haven't um, paused to ask any questions before um, we spend. We'll probably spend about an hour in those authoring groups. We'll come back from them a little bit early um, and take a break. And then after that, Josh is going to walk us through how to um, determine whether your dynamic supports are actually supporting folks um, and getting the desires you want. So um, are there any questions for Garen, for Marvez, for me? or for Josh um, about anything we've talked about today. Okay. Um, well, you'll have us in your breakout rooms if you do come up with questions. Um, so, Garen, I'm hoping the next slide, do you want to talk through the next slide and I'm going to open up some breakout rooms. Um, this is just a little bit of what we're hoping you talk about in your breakout room or what we think you might want to. So I think that our goal today is really going to be um, thinking through uh, 
like places where you might be implementing these simulations. So our, our aim for the three-part workshop was really to put you in a position to conduct your own research, to work towards training and building your own classifiers, uh, either for text or for audio, and then thinking about how you might use those classifiers to provide dynamic support. And one of the things that's nice about the Teacher Moments platform is that you notice that you've been able to author your own simulations. And so as you start thinking about the places where you might run a study, you can ask yourself some questions along the lines of, how might I need to change the simulation to make it sort of contextually appropriate to the group that I plan on doing a study with? So if you're doing an implementation with say, a partner teacher or uh, with some, some professional development organization, that's a great opportunity to start asking the people that you'll be working with, how might we think about modifying this simulation so that it becomes really contextually relevant uh, to the population that we're working with? And that's a that's, so again, you've gone through the authoring process, you know how to modify the simulation. It might mean changing the context slide so that you give some contextual features that are relevant to the people that you're working with. But once you sort of have a target population in mind to run your study, then uh, you can start asking, you know, are you getting the data that you want? How can you revise the scenario, both, both in terms of contextualization, but maybe you need to refine and shape those questions further to get responses that are relevant or related to what you're trying to measure with a classifier. Um, where might participants uh, struggle in your scenario and what supports can help them? So as we've been talking about all the ways in which you can either put a dynamic support or even a static support within the simulation, um, I think that where you wanna leverage those supports is where people are really having a hard time. And so again, this is one of those situations where you don't need a large data collection to find some insights. I could easily see some form of an implementation with even like 10 users where you interview them after the fact. And you're like, where did you have a hard time with the simulation? What was difficult for you? And if those difficulties are like, oh, I just had a hard time like pretending like the situation was relevant to me, then you've got some work to do in sort of making sure that it's contextually relevant. Um, if they were like, oh, that was actually a really challenging thing for me to answer, um, in an interview, you could quickly probe and ask, well, what was challenging about that situation? Um, and is it a situation where maybe they just have a hard time coming up with what to say? Or is it that they have so many different things that they wanna say they're not sure how to organize their thinking? And those two things could actually trigger very different supports that you would think through. So if they have a lot of things to say and they're having a hard time figuring out what to say, uh, think about the support we talked about where you write down three options and then take a look at the three options you wrote down and pick what you're gonna say and say it. Maybe just having them write it out would be actually a support that would help them organize their thinking. Um, if that's not sufficient, you could easily layer on additional supports that would give them some form of a criteria to select what might be the best response after they've come up with three options. So there's lots of ways that you could think about supporting people if they're having a hard time organizing your ideas. If they're having a hard time figuring out what to say, uh, the other supports that we talked about, like consider acknowledging the stomach ache that Jeremy has. You're drawing direct attention to something that maybe they're having a hard time figuring out how to respond. So why don't you highlight a feature for them and have them orient a response around that feature. So again, these are, these are really early stages of research and thinking about how to support uh, participants within simulations, there are not a lot of insights at this stage um, because we really are doing some transformative work here in shifting from you know, either role plays that are done in person uh, to some form of a digital interaction uh, where we can start thinking about these real-time supports that happen within the simulation. Um, so I feel like there's some interesting opportunities here. You don't need to go big to get really interesting findings. And we're all very curious about how to build effective supports, either static or dynamic, and you're in a great position to explore those questions and conduct some form of a study. Um, so with that said, um, I'm excited to say that we can start building supports and we can go into breakout rooms and you have the uh, sort of collective perspectives of the folks from TSL to join those breakout rooms. And we're really excited to work with you on this. Awesome, and Garen, I think, um... If you stop sharing for a second, I updated the slideshow um, with the groups. Um, so you might have to go out and then open it up again. And some of these, some of the breakout rooms might be a little bit small, um, but we will see how we're doing in them. Josh? Okay. Uh, okay. 
Um, so in this uh, part of the session, we're gonna be talking a little bit about how do you evaluate if your feedback is actually working at, at, as you intend it to work. And we're gonna be talking about a number of different ways that you can approach it and different research designs you can use. Um, so I wanted to start off um, and just asking people kind of to do some brainstorming and just think like, what are some ways that you could know, like, is the feedback that I'm giving based on my classifier, is it actually changing people's behavior, affecting their knowledge or mindsets in the way that I'm intending? So if you could just write in the chat, um, and then we'll take some time to think about um, how, how, how you go about doing that. So, so just looking um, at what people are, are, are typing, um, you know, thinking about different ways you can collect data. Someone suggested um, Zarka suggested sending out a questionnaire. Marva suggested looking at behavior in the simulations themselves. And Sarah uh, suggested doing an interview. And those are all really good ways uh, to think about how you actually find out what people are, are, are how, what people are experiencing. Um, you look about, oh, people asked about, people mentioned exit surveys, uh, follow-up scenarios. So yeah, or giving people a chance to do the scenario again and seeing what they're doing. These are all excellent suggestions. Um, I've made a kind of table. Um, so on one side is the outcome. So these are all the things that you might want to measure. Um, and it kind of goes a number of different way, things that you could you could think about. So one of the sort of easiest things to collect is to ask people like, did this experience change your mind about this thing? Did did do you think differently? Um, and so this is kind of like the most basic uh, way of looking at change, um, but you know it has a number of limitations, including the fact that people reflections on what they would have thought are often not accurate. The people will say, oh yeah, this totally changed my mind. Um, but you know, how do you know that if you had done something differently, it would have also changed their mind or they're just saying that because that's what they think you as a designer want to hear. Um, another method of looking at outcomes is, is thinking about um, using survey items. So someone, uh, AC mentioned the, the CDQ, measure. Um, so looking at surveys, you can do pre and post surveys to look at are people changing in particular beliefs. Um, that, that's one method for looking at changes. Um, what's better about looking at, you know, especially if you do pre and post survey, um, is that you're sort of looking at in the changes within an individual measure. Um, rather than people's own self-reported changes. However, you're still, there's still other threats in terms of thinking about, um, you know, is, are people sort of, would they have changed anyway? Uh, whether or not you gave them the intervention, if they had just done the simulation, would they have changed? Sometimes people 
will think, oh, I have to answer higher because this is the post survey. So like, you know, clearly I need to show that I've learned something. Um, or so it may not actually be a good measure of what you're looking at, depending on the type of um, the type of uh, research question you have. Um, another option, uh, this is the number four in the list, is sort of looking at activity in the simulation. And this is something um, Marv has mentioned, uh, Druva also mentioned, is actually looking and seeing what people do in the simulations. And that can be useful for thinking about, let's say you wanted to change people's behavior, you know, give them feedback about something they do in the simulation, actually going and looking like, did they incorporate that feedback in future responses? I think is useful. Um, you can even take that a step further and say like, not just in the same simulation, but doing another simulation that's similar and seeing, are they transferring some of the, the what they've learned to a new um, situation? Um, can be a sort of further proof of the effectiveness of particular um, type of intervention. And then, um, you know, going even further out, you know, one of the things that I think is important is that behavior and simulation should extend out to behavior outside of the simulations. So uh, thinking about not just like, are people acting equitably? Let's say equity is your thing that you're interested in measuring. Are they uh, acting equitably within the simulation, but are they actually taking what they're learning and applying it with their students? And so to do that, uh, you need some kind of way of measuring that. So you might think about, you know, doing an observation of, of, of participants and following them and seeing how they're actually applying what they've learned in the classroom. And then, you know, kind of even going further out is like, let's say, how does this actually affect students? So looking at student outcomes, student surveys, you know, if you're doing something that's related to student achievement, looking about how it affects student achievement. So obviously that is sort of another, you know, level of, of, of data collection and, but I think it's something to think about like, what are the different levels that we could measure the impact of various, um, various interventions within uh, teacher moments. Um, so that's like one side of the equation is what are you measuring? Um, I think that uh, measurement is a series of, of trade-offs. Um, I often like to think there's not, there's not that there's like, like the best way of measuring something is the best thing, way of measuring something for a particular situation and different situations require different levels of precision, different situations require different types of measures. Um, and some situations are, some measures are more appropriate than others. Um, so one thing to think about is, is sort of what is the relationship between your intervention and your outcome? Um, and this is something where there, there's a trade-off between if, you, if your outcome is very, tied to your intervention, you're more likely to see an effect because people are responding directly to the intervention. So let's say you're looking at like, I'm gonna give people very specific feedback uh, on their response and then see if they incorporate that feedback in the subsequent response. Well, that's like as proximal as you can get. So if you're gonna see any effect, it's likely to be there, but that might not be the thing you care about. Maybe the thing you care about is actually this more distal outcome. And that's actually the thing that you wanna measure. Um, another thing to think about, and you know, we've been kind of talking about this a lot, is like how many people do you have in your data? Certain certain things are easier if it's a larger effect. You can see those effects with smaller amounts of data. Um, as the effects get more distal, as the effects get, get less closely tied to the intervention, you need more statistical power. You need more people in your sample in order to detect those effects. Um, and related to that is also data collection resources. You know, some things are very easy to collect data from, you know, particularly surveys can be pretty easily collected. Um, you know, interviews require another level of, of um, resources in order to, you know, schedule interviews, collect the data, transcribe it potentially. Um, and then even going further out, if you want to do things like looking at observations or student, student test scores, those are things that will require additional resources in order to obtain. And so part of what your decision making needs to be is what are the resources that I have to look at the types of uh, interventions that I'm interested in. Um, and my final thing is that you don't want the <laughs> measurement of the outcome to sort of take over your simulation. So if, it, you, you don't want to end up in a situation where you have so many surveys at the end that like, you just feel like I'm taking a survey and not doing a simulation and, and it kind of ruins the learning experience. So I think one thing that I've tried to think about is like, how can I make the, the measure of the outcome 
integrated within the simulation itself enough so it feels like an authentic part of the experience rather than sort of an add-on that um, you know someone has to do in order to meet the requirements for a research study. Um, so now we talk about what to measure, but in order to measure something, you need to compare it to something else because just measuring doesn't tell you anything. You need to know like have we actually seen any changes in order to see changes or effects. You need to have a point of comparison. Um, and this is actually quite challenging when designing research is figuring out how do we, like, how do we, what's the right level of comparison? Um, so one way that you can compare is you can sort of ask people to compare themselves to their former selves. You can say like, how much have I changed? Um, but as I said, this is, you know, potentially problematic if you are asking people and people sort of want to say, oh yeah, it's very positive, I learned a lot. Um, so it might actually reflect, you know, what would have happened anyway if they had done something differently. Um, there's also the level of, um, you know, sometimes people um, will change no, like through maturation. So basically, you know, having participated in the, uh, you know, class or the workshop that you're doing, they, they would have had to change anyway. So just doing a pre-post survey doesn't doesn't address the fact that there might have been changes that would have occurred anyway had you not done your intervention. Um, the other issue is some called regression to the mean. So let's say you know you have a class and and students don't know a lot about the topic. There's probably going to be a huge uh, shift that would have happened anyway just because they start learning a little bit about the topic. Um, but you know that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the intervention that's causing it. And often, especially if you're focusing on people who need additional support in an area, like you'll see a very large shift as people kind of regress toward whatever the the, the mean score is. Um, and so um, you know another kind of level up in terms of design is is having some kind of comparison group. Where you're saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna have two groups, and one group's gonna get the intervention, one group's not going to get the intervention. And we're going to compare how those groups do. Um, so now we're getting kind of into the level of 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 having some kind of control intervention group. Now, one way you could do this is you could sort of compare either like get two groups and just, you know, one, let's say you have one class, you do, you do the intervention, one class, you don't do the intervention, then you can compare those two classes. Um, the challenge with that is that those classes might not be equivalent to each other. One class, let's say, may have more students that are really interested in this topic, where the other, other class doesn't have it, not as much interest. So, you know, those groups may not be sort of equivalent um, to, to one another. Um, so this is why, um, you know, people often use randomization as a way of getting um, equivalent groups to look at the effects of an intervention. So with randomization, um, on average, it ensures that there are no systematic differences between the two groups. Like any comparisons you make, any differences are due to the intervention itself. Um, now, this is somewhat dependent on how many people you actually have in these groups. When you have a very small amount of people, there, there may be differences, even though they're not systematically different, you might see them within the actual difference, the, the, the two groups. Um, another issue um, with, with randomization is sometimes you can get unequal distributions of, of, of folks, depending especially on how many uh, people you have in, in the sample. Um, and so it's not, it's not, randomization doesn't solve everything, but it can be a very, very useful tool in terms of, of trying to see if there are actually differences. If I see differences in the outcomes, is it because of my, uh, my intervention? Um, and in certain research communities, it's considered sort of what's put up what the gold standard. I don't really love this description because I think it places a hierarchy on, on research which I don't think is actually true in practice. I think you could design a very, very good study that doesn't use randomized groups and you can still make claims about, you know, how do people experience the intervention? But I think if your goal is to say like, my intervention caused people to act differently or my intervention caused people to teach in a different way and you wanna be sure that it's not due to any other circumstances, I think that using randomization um, is a way to go. Um, finally, one, Final thing about um, randomization is that there, there are also ethical considerations in terms of, you know, do you want to withhold a potentially beneficial treatment to certain groups? 
um, who may, um, you know, like if you're, if you're, you're going to only give certain people in your class a beneficial support, like what does it mean to not give it to other people? So that's something to think about as you're thinking about like, what are the people who aren't getting support? What are, 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 are they getting in terms of their, um, in terms of their uh, experience in, 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 the, in, in the simulation? I think so. I just want to add quickly, Josh, that there's a link at the foot of the slide that is the Schmidt Tools competition proposal that we put together to incorporate A-B testing into teacher moments, which Josh was instrumental in uh, drafting the submission. Um, and that submission has moved on to phase three. We got that wonderful news yesterday. Uh, so what, what that means is that likely the next changes that we'll be making to teacher moments will be to uh, add functionality that supports A-B testing in the platform. And there's a link to the proposal there. So if you want to see what the next uh, set of functionality that will be added to teacher moments will look like, uh, there's some mock-ups and some descriptions of why we're incorporating A-B testing and, and why we think that's an important step to take. And uh, what happens next with Schmidt uh, Futures is that uh, we'll pitch uh, a proposal on at integrating A-B testing into teacher moments. And I think there's something like, uh, uh, 60 people that will be pitching in that competition and they'll select some subset of that and they have something like four million dollars set aside as awards to, to support the development of platforms like this that sort of move research forward uh, with technology that supports people to do really innovative work. And so we're, we're we feel lucky uh, to be a competitor and we feel like that AB testing is a fantastic set of features and functions to incorporate into the platform. So this is likely going to be the next set of work that uh, that is going to be slated for teacher moments. And I just wanted to call your attention to that link. So if you want to take a look at it, you can. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, no, we're super excited about uh, the, the A-B testing functionality uh, in teacher moments. I think it will really, uh, I think it will really will we'll push, will we'll push the, the, the research forward. Um, I wanted to, to just highlight one so this is actually hopefully going to be a feature of the A-B testing is um, stratification. Um, so one challenge, as I mentioned, with um, using A-B testing or randomization is that you're not, you know, especially with smaller samples or, or unbalanced samples, they're not always equivalent. Um, and this can be an issue. Let's say you want to have an intervention that, you know, if you like they, that if people say a certain thing, they get a certain intervention. Well, what happens if in your, in your randomization just happens to be that like you get a lot of people who didn't say that particular thing. Um, and so they're not getting the intervention. So your groups are sort of unbalanced. Um, and so you can use stratification in order to ensure that like the groups are equivalent in terms of who would be of need of the particular intervention. Um, and and this, all of this actually improves the statistical power of, of, of your design. Um, you could also set it up so you actually oversample people. Let's say you wanted to oversample people who needed the intervention in your intervention group, you could also do that. Um, and because you, you sort of know the probability of someone being in either group, you can uh, uh, adjust for that in your analysis. Um, so I think like we're really thinking about using this not just for kind of, you know, learning, you know, individual, but also to use it as a learning science platform so people can do really intensive research um, on teacher moments instead of very strong um, research designs. Um, I wanted to give two examples. So obviously, you haven't implemented this feature into teacher moments yet. Um, so we use other platforms to do some types of um, comparisons. So I'm going to give two examples. Uh, the first example is from our Becoming a More Equitable Educator course, um, where uh, edX has a feature, an A-B testing feature embedded within the platform. So you, so you can actually randomize who gets exposed to different content in um, edX. And we uh, developed this study design where we wanted to look at the impact of the um, Jeremy's Journal simulation on people's um, equity mindsets and 
look at the impact of doing gyrational simulation and watching the video debrief on equity mindsets. Um, but we didn't want to withhold content from people. Remember I talked about the ethical issues. We didn't want to say like, oh, you know, you're not going to get this simulation because it would have affected people's learning experience. So what we did in edX is we actually randomized uh, where people got the survey. Um, so we embedded the, sur the Jeremy's Journal survey into uh, the equity mindset survey into Jeremy's Journal. So some people got it before they did the simulation. Some people got it after this did the simulation. And some people got no survey within the simulation, but later when they did the video debrief, they, 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 there was a survey. So it allowed us to capture sort of like, you know, what was the effect at, you know, having not done any simulations? What was the effect of having done the simulation? What was the effect of having done the simulation and, and the video debrief? Um, so this was a design that we came out with that allowed us to look at the various effects of different components without having to say like, okay, you're not going to get this particular component. Um, but um, one of the things we found was it didn't have um, any effect uh, or at least any effect in the direction that we were hoping. Um, so there wasn't any statistically significant differences um, on the equity mindset measure um, between the control group and then the simulation and the simulation to do a debrief group. Um, I actually ended up writing a whole paper about this, um, which I don't have time to summarize here, but sort of the gist is that I think that one of the challenges, and this kind of goes back to what we've been talking about in this whole session, is that there wasn't actually a lot of feedback within Jeremy's journal in the original version without the AI. And so people would often kind of see what they wanted to see. And even after they saw the video debrief, um, I think that doing sometimes people we sort of found that people who already had equity attitudes kind of grown in saw the things that they thought pointed to equity and people who had more of an equality mindset saw the things that pointed to equality. Um, you actually see that there's a little bit of a, of a decrease. Um, it's not statistically significant, but between the not having the simulation and doing the simulation, so actually something doing the simulation actually decreased equity mindsets uh, to some extent. So, one of the conclusions was that yeah, I th we think that it might be important to have the feedback um, within Jeremy's journal so people are actually getting feedback as they're going through the simulation. So one potential future study is to sort of redesign this and to have it so some people will get Jeremy's journal with feedback and some people will get Jeremy's journal without feedback and seeing like does that, that actually affect people's equity mindsets or not. Um, so the second example I want to give, so this was not a randomized experiment. Um, but it, what did use AI feedback. Um, so this was in roster justice. We developed a classifier that um, in the scenario, you get a computer science roster and the roster has a large imbalance in terms of gender and race. The students are whiter and more male than the school as a whole. And you are asked in the first part, like, what do you notice about, about these rosters? Um, and one of the, we developed a classifier which basically said like, oh, I noticed that there's some kind of racial or gender imbalance in, in, the, in the rosters. So it was detecting whether people correctly acknowledge the imbalance. Um, and we then created some feedback where people didn't notice the imbalance to say, oh, did you notice that there was a large imbalance in the class rosters? Um, and so uh, I worked with Marvez and uh, uh, two undergraduates, Aria and Sydney, and uh, they actually did most of the work in development classifiers. So I was mostly there as support. Um, and so they uh, created these classifiers that detected um, whether they acknowledge race and gender and that provided feedback for those who didn't. Um, and here are sort of the, 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 the metrics that we use to evaluate how, 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 how well the classifier is performing. Um, um, and so then once they got the feedback, we then looked to see like, after they got that initial feedback, how did that affect their subsequent responses? And as a point of comparison, we looked at people who had done this without any feedback in the online course. So we wanted to see like, did the people who got the feedback, did their um, responses after they got the feedback were different from those who, who were in the online course. And so we only had 17 people in our pilots. So it was a pretty small sample. So, you know, all kinds of uh, qualifications there. 
Um, but one of the interesting findings was on the first prompt, they were less likely to notice the racial and gender imbalance. So only 70% of people in the, in the pilot said that, that there was a, a um, imbalance compared to 81% in the online course. But then afterwards, they were more likely to acknowledge what acknowledge the uh, racial and gender differences in their subsequent responses. So there was a gap in the opposite direction for people in the AI version were much more likely to mention it in their responses in the simulation. Um, and so we sort of saw this as evidence is that the, the, the intervention which changes people's subsequent behavior uh, within the simulation. And this is one way that we could document it by looking at this comparison group that didn't get the, 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 the AI sports. Now, obviously those groups are not necessarily comparable to each other. It wasn't randomized. Um, there were a lot more people in, in the online course than in the, in the, in the uh, pilot. Um, so it's not a perfect design by sort of a, you know, randomized experiment perspective, but it did take the resources that we had and I think, you know, was a more positive, you know, finding that, oh, these, these AI supports can work. And obviously, after this finding, we could think about doing some kind of A-B testing where we tested getting the supports or not getting the supports. Um, so before I go into the reflection, does anyone have any questions about the either doing research designs or any of the studies that I shared right now. Can I, can I ask a question, Josh, just to kick off the oh, conversation? Sure, yeah. yeah. Can, you go, can you go back to the research design in the MOOC course where you sort of have the survey at three different legs of the, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I was curious when you were putting this, when we were putting this research design together, did you consider uh, different orders to simulation, video debrief, and and if you did you first off, did you consider it? And second, um, if uh, why did you go with this this approach as opposed to looking at something like an order effect? You mean like if we change when the video debrief happened, like doing the video debrief first versus so yeah, so like you know, give, giving people some information about like the, so the video debrief itself is about showing different ways in which people could respond, right? It's sort of yeah. like looking different ways in which people think about these challenges. And so obviously you couldn't show a debrief video before the simulation, but you could introduce some element of like, you know, here's a bunch of different ways to think about the concept within the simulation that could have been given before the simulation um, mm -hmm. and seeing if there's any potential order effect between um, breaking out different ways of thinking about things um, yeah. before or after the simulation. Yeah, I think, I think you know, one of the, the things I was trying to do was not introduce more, um, like you keep the initial design of the unit the same. So in the first version of the course, we had only had like, you know, this it was intro video simulation, video debrief. Um, I didn't want to test like, oh, I'm going to change that. Um, the survey hadn't actually been there. So that was, that was the new thing. So we had, um, and, and I think what this this is like maybe I should make it a little more clear is they did everyone did a pre-survey and then this survey was a second survey. So we already had like where people were at the beginning. So we could adjust for those differences, um, you know, when they got to to the second part. Unfortunately, this was in the first unit, so there wasn't actually that much time between when they started the course and when they got to this point. Um, and so it is. On one hand, it's good because like they didn't really do that much before they got to the the simulation. On the other hand, um, you know, it's possible that someone would have done the pre-survey and then like half an hour later taken the survey again. So we wouldn't expect to see that that, that that much difference was. Let, let me just quickly qualify my curiosity about this because one of the things that I'm curious about is simulations and giving people opportunities to practice. I feel like I'm curious about the difference between the experience of when you have like multiple ideas of how to respond in the simulation versus like trying to figure out like what the one thing that you could come up with to say is, mm -hmm. right? And so like from my perspective, I'm curious if like, you know, we this, this design sort of shows like, here's an intro, here's the simulation, and now let's talk about the variety of ways in which, you know, people mm -hmm. have responded to the simulation, sort of opens up people's eyes towards multiple approaches mm -hmm. after they've had a chance to enact. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm just curious if like 
and I, and I feel like from my perspective, I think, you know, when I think about that, that dimension, I think about it in terms of like in-service teachers and pre-service teachers, like uh, people with a lot of background experience might have like a bunch of different things that they would want to try. Um, but people that don't have a lot of experience might need some support in thinking about variable approaches before they go into a simulation. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I feel like that's a component that I'm curious about. And, and particularly like in a MOOC context, like, you know, can you tell yeah. us a little more about the population where they, did, did you get information about their teaching experience? Yeah, I mean, so there's, you know, the, the online courses attract a range of the people. Um, you know, some people are teachers or teaching in classrooms, some people are principals. Um, we also have people who are um, instructional designers, teacher educators, people who are just sort of interested in educational issues. Um, you know, at, at, on average, about 50% of people say that they're working in K-12 schools. Um, so it's, you know, pretty good chunk of the population, but it's, it's not everyone. Um, in terms of how experienced they are, I mean, I think that they're, you know, probably kind of around the, the median level in terms of, you know, there, there are, they tend to, you know, trend a little younger compared to sort of probably the teaching population, but there aren't a lot of very, very new teachers. It's probably more people who at least have a, a few years experience. Um, I actually say I think the biggest differentiating factor is sort of, you know, how much have people done the work before to think about, you know, what does equity mean? Um, you know, a lot of people, when they start this course, sort of think equity means, you know, holding high expectations for all students, which is definitely a part of equity. But sometimes that can translate into thinking that, oh, that means I need to treat every student the same. And, and that's kind of one of the ideas we're trying to challenge in the course. Um, so that uh, was really interesting. Thanks, Josh, for sharing all that. We um, yeah. we're actually just about done, and I am attempting to get the survey link. Okay, <laughs> um, right. I'm just gonna pop um, a survey link in the chat, and we're hoping that we can just take a few minutes to do this right now, um, so that we are able to get your feedback on the session. Um, so I've just popped it into the chat and hopefully you can see it, but if you could take um, just five minutes right now before we go to do this, we would really appreciate getting your feedback. And, and, and thank you. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed hanging out with you all on Saturday. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>